morning, everyone. So good to see you today. <laughs> we are going to get started with number two in our hymn books. That's number two. Glory to his name. Number two. Two. Let's all stand as we sing. Glory to his name. Number two in your hymn books. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where the cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. This is number two in our hymn books on that last stanza. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Excellent singing. Please be seated. Come on up here, youngins. We're going to sing a song. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Now we'll do careful little ears, careful little mouth. All righty. Is there enough room up there for everybody? Everybody's going to squish around a little bit. There we go. All right, let's get some pointer fingers. Hey, Nate, how's it going, man? Pointer fingers, you got you got a, oh look at that, he's got a pointer finger. He knows exactly where to put it. <laughs> Alright. Careful little eyes. What you see. Alright, here we go. Oh be careful little eyes, what you see. Oh be careful little eyes, what you see. For your father up above is looking down in love. Oh be careful little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For your Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For your Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, excellent sing. Oh, don't run off quite yet. Don't run off quite yet. You know, this is a kind of sad but wonderful Sunday for us because the, many of these youngins have sat in a Sunday school class for several years with one of our teachers who is going to be leaving this week. Miss Rachel, would you mind coming up here for a, just a moment? Just a moment. Because the boys and girls have some things for you. And guys, if you have something up here you want to grab, come on over here and grab it. And they have put together some cards for you. And Miss Rachel, oh, look at that. There's even more. And there's more. Miss Rachel has been their Sunday school teacher for many, all, probably all these youngins at one time or another. And um, they are going to miss you greatly. Needless to say, there'll be a lot of folks missing you greatly. So, boys and girls, if you have a card that you'd like to give to Miss Rachel, you can go ahead and give that to her. Give her a hug, a squeeze, whatever. Shake her left hand or whatever you need to do. And, uh, oh, look at all that. There's cards galore. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm getting pictures, too. And so we just want to say, and I'm sure the kids want to say, thank you so much for your faithfulness in Sunday school for all these years. Lord bless you. We have, 
not, I, I hate, I'm not going to use the word replace because nobody can replace you, but we have another Sunday school teacher for the youngins. I want to ask Michelle Street to stand up and say hi to everybody and say hi to the youngins. And uh, she is going to be taking over uh, Rachel's Sunday school class, has already, and uh, looking forward to uh, many years of faithful service as we've seen over these past years. And so with that, Lord bless you. And boys and girls, you're dismissed. Head on down to junior, or head on down to Sunday school. See y'all later. Ah, Vieter Zane, farewell. And oh my. And so ends an error. All righty. So nice to see you all this morning. It's going to be in Sunday school this morning. And uh, in case you didn't notice on the way in, we added a couple more pictures to our River Towns Outreach, and uh, the one picture, Brother George, you're in the background, uh, actually the reflection of that picture, and so if you didn't see that picture on your way, and it's the oval looking one, so they were going through Florence, uh, putting tracks out, and uh, they ran across a car that had uh, skeletal remains in the front seat. Anyway, I thought that was quite humorous, and uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you guys got a picture of that. But because uh, you never know who you might run into when you're out uh, on visitation. I want to invite your attention, please, over in the book of Colossians chapter uh, 3 this morning. Uh, we are going through a, uh, this, a little series here from Colossians 3, talking about the resurrected life. And, um, of course, Colossians 3 starts with that phrase, if you then be risen with Christ. And so we're going to be going through, we have a couple more lessons in there, but these are just some characteristics of the, of the risen life. If you've been risen with Christ, if you have died with Him um, it, um, and identified with His death, received the forgiveness of your sins, and of course then been uh, raised with Him, uh, you've been made alive in Christ Jesus, and so you are alive from the dead. And these are the characteristics of a life that has experienced that new birth, that resurrection uh, from, uh, from our, our, uh, the, our, the death in our, because of our sins and our trespasses. And we've looked at several already. We've looked at this um, heavenly mindedness and seeking those things which are above. We, we talked about our affections and how, you know, our, the passions, what really drives our lives. We looked at that in verse number one and two. And we talked about this new life, which is really surrendered to Christ and, and hidden in him. We spent a couple weeks um, talking about this hatred that needs to exist in our life uh, against sin. We need to hate Sin, and that's what the Bible talking about. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And it talks about putting some things to death so that sin doesn't have that grasp on us anymore. Uh, and we're reminded, of course, in the scriptures, that's what we used to be, so we shouldn't walk anymore therein. Um, we've been, t uh, last week, um, we were, uh, let me get my file fixed here. There we go. Uh, last week, we were talking about um, this, um, this new man um, in verse number, uh, let me read verse number 10 and 11, then we're going to be, be in verse number 12, uh, uh, um, 12 through 14 this morning. But it says, uh, I'm reading from Colossians 3.10, and that put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so last week we talked about what it means to be renewed. It's talking about a remodeling or taking something uh, that is um, um, really has been damaged, has, has, uh, has weathered not very well the course of life, and that's what we all were. And then we got to know Christ, and there needs to be this constant maintenance or renewing, improving. Uh, and that, of course, comes based on the image of Jesus Christ. And, and that's what that verse is saying, that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the risen life is a renewed life that is looking more like Jesus day after day. And, and this is what the Christian life ought to be like. We ought to be examining the scriptures. We ought to be understanding uh, the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and we ought to be working towards imitating him. We do live in a society that's imitation type, and that is they're always looking for some kind of role model or something to pattern their lives after. 
And, um, and certainly, as it's been well said, that you, that you are so unique, just like everyone else. And uh, in other words, we're, we're always trying to make ourselves into something else. Uh, well, why not make ourselves into Jesus Christ? And that's what the scriptures are encouraging us to do. This, this morning, uh, we're picking up, let me, let me re, I read there verse number 10, verse number 11. Um, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or, uh, or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but, in, uh, but Christ is all and in all. And it's talking about the fact that, uh, that uh, you know, especially this Jew and Gentile thing, um, uh, Jew and Greek, there, there is, um, there's, there's no like Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Uh, the book of Ephesians that just hammers on that subject over and over again about one faith and one baptism and, and one Lord. And, and so he reminds us that there's not like two separate type of religions for different types of people. They're talking about barbarians and Scythians. We're talking about folks that are remote and, and so far removed uh, from Israel as if they got you know some kind of different faith. We all have the same type of faith. And um, I've said this many times uh, from here uh, when it comes to salvation. There's not like a different salvation for adults as it is for kids. It's all the same salvation. We're all saved by grace through faith. It requires the recognition of sinfulness and repentance of sin and, and a faith in Jesus Christ. And it's no different no matter who you are. And so our faith in Christ um, of course, is based on the same ingredient, and so should our life in Christ. And so God doesn't give some kind of leeway in saying, okay, you need to be in the image of Christ, you know, like for your culture. It doesn't say that. You know, one of the, one of the um, struggles that many missionaries have that going into a different culture is discovering that many things that happen in that culture run extremely contrary to the faith that we find uh, rooted in the scriptures, and particularly uh, several of the missionaries that we've had in South Africa and Botswana, uh, one of the problems they have down there is the immorality that exists, um, the, um, the lack of, of um, uh, marital stability that exists in these countries, and so it's very difficult to find men that are qualified for the ministry. And so there are some religions in those, uh, in those countries that will compromise on this particular um, area because they find it very difficult to find folks that are qualified to pastor. And it's because of past immoralities, marriage, uh, divorces, remarriage, things like that. As a matter of fact, many in the culture never do marry because of the cost of marrying is so high, they say, well, no, we're, not even, we're never even thinking about marriage because I can't afford to marry somebody. And so there's a lot of immorality and fornication because of that. And so, you know, I'm just pointing out the fact when Jesus point, um, uh, points to the fact that we need to be more like Christ, he doesn't give allowances to say, well, it's okay for certain things because of the culture, whether it's Jew or Greek, whether it's barbarian or Scythian. It doesn't matter. It's based and rooted in the Word of God, and that's it. Our image is to be the image of Christ as it's portrayed in the Scriptures, and nothing less than that. And so this morning, though, we're moving on to verse number um, 12 through 14, and I'll read. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of, of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. What a blessing it is to be able to assemble together. I'm so thankful, Lord, that we um, have the opportunity even this morning uh, to honor one that has served you so faithfully. And I pray, Father, that we would all be very mindful of our service to, to you and that, uh, Lord, you give us opportunity and then and give us the ability. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for all that you have provided for us individually, but also, Father, for what you've provided in this church. And I'm thankful, Father, uh, for our dear sister Rachel. And I pray, Father, you'd bless her 
um, and what endeavors you have for her in the future. Now, Father, this time we'll spend together. May it be pleasing to you. Teach us, Lord, what is important, um, an important ingredient to have in our lives and in our ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to be talking this morning about the risen life. Of course, that's the general subject we've been talking about for weeks. And we're going to talk about a very specific ingredient that is essential in the risen life. And of course, if you didn't pick up on that, I'll read this again uh, here in verse number 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Okay, um, You brought it up last night in men's prayer, talking about love and charity. And it's a very important subject, uh, which you see being brought up here. We're talking about the... Um, the risen life. Now, a um, couple things I just want to mention. The, um, the word charity that's here, of course, is the word agape. And I bring this up often when we talk about uh, love and things like that. The Bible speaks about love in several different ways. Um, agape is the term for love. It's translated charity in many places. And it's a, I, I have no qualms uh, interchanging the word love and charity when it comes to the word agape. The word charity is used because it's a great way of expressing the, um, the outwardness of it, the action-oriented emphasis in the type of love that God has for us and that we should have for one another because there has to be an action to it. It is more than just emotion. It is, is, a, it is a work of the will. We choose to love. We do love. And, and so that's the kind of love God has for us. That word agape is used many times in the scriptures and um, some great portions of scripture, like for instance in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, often referred to as the love chapter. Tremendous list of characteristics based on, uh, on God's love towards us and how we should love others. So it is a, it's, a, it's that type of love that's driven by will. In other words, we choose to love, and that's what's used here. It's unconditional. Now, there are other words for love that are found. Another word primarily that's used for love in the Bible is the word phileo, and that's what we were talking about last night a little bit. Philos, phileo, that's the, the, the verb. Um, and it's, um, that word is, uh, whereas agape is more of the will, phileo is more of emotion. It is affection. It is often translated brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philos. And so it is, it is, it's not a bad thing. And that's the kind of word we would use because, you know, we'd say, you know, what do you, what do you want for dinner? Oh, I want pizza because I love pizza. Well, that's, that's the word that if, if we were speaking Greek at an Italian restaurant ordering pizza, that's what we would use. I love pizza. So it's not a bad thing. It's an expression of emotion based, mostly based on experience. And so, you know, you, you come into a congregation of believers, you get to know one another, you build relationships, there's an affection that builds. And so you, you respond to that affection and that, in an emotional way. I love this place. I love the people there. And it's based on experience. Again, nothing wrong with that. Now, there's another word. It's not used in the Bible, though. The word eros is another Greek word. Um, if you look at, if, if you pull out your favorite Greek dictionary and look it up, you'll find that it's used in a lot of the um, uh, early church fathers. They used the word. Uh, several of, of the um, um, historical accounts concerning the first century use this word over and over and over again. It, it, it's the word eros. It has more to do with passion. It's the word that would be used for um, like a marital type of relationship, eros. Um, and again, it's not a bad thing, but it, it is passion. Sometimes, of course, it could lead to bad things, just like even philos can lead to bad things. And that is, you know, somebody has this, uh, an overt affection for something that could be bad for them. And so, you know, anything um, that is driven um, by emotion or by passion can have a tendency of leading to something that's not good. But both passion and emotions are subject to circumstance and inclined to change. 
But when it comes to agape, when it comes to the love that God has for us and the love that God is asking us to have not only towards him, but also towards others, it is based on the will. I will love. I choose to love. So it's non-conditional. It's not based on circumstance. It's not based on uh, response. In other words, I love. I get nothing back, so I'm not going to love anymore. That's not what agape is. It is based on a determined will. And, and so the risen life is held together by love. That, this is uh, back in our text here, as it says in verse number t- 14. And above all these things, put on charity. Now, if you remember about the, you know, putting off the old man, putting on the new, it is an exchange that needs to take place. We are replacing uh, things the way we used to be. Um, and we're taking those off, removing them from us, and putting, replacing things into our life. And, and so as we do that, we have to make sure that love is a key ingredient in that. Please notice um, there in, again in verse number 14, it talks about love, a charity, as a bond of, perf- of perfectness. A bond of perfectness. So... It's like an ingredient that holds things together. It's um, the word perfectness has to do with um, maturity. It has to do with completeness. Uh, The risen life is uh, is a mature life, and and not mature as just in age wise, but mature as in experience and completeness. uh, Not talking about I got all my act together, but God has provided us experiences and opportunities and talents and skills, the gifts of the Spirit, all those things working in our life. And we can have a lot of great things, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like this. Um, if, you are, if you are going out, like on a, on a you're going to be traveling, you're taking a trip somewhere, maybe you're going backpacking or canoeing or boating or maybe... You know, like Mrs. Short and I, we were in the woods last week, grabbed the trailer and went to the woods. Now, okay, think about it this way. You can have all the stuff that you need for a great experience. Maybe you're going to be flying somewhere, got a trip planned to go someplace, and you've got all the stuff you need. You've got your, I don't know, your camera, you've got your, um, um, your hiking shoes, you're going to do some hiking. Uh, maybe like Mrs. Shorter and I, we had our we, we had a kayak on the roof. You know, we we're going to do some boating. We got fishing rods. You can have all that stuff, but unless you find a way of bringing it all together and having it usable, it, it would be kind of like you know just throwing everything in in a bin somewhere and dragging it behind the the truck or something, expecting that when you get there, you'll be able to sort it all out and and do something with it. I mean, imagine that. And I know, you know, Brother Denny, if you go fishing, you know, you put the fishing rod in the back of the truck. You expect when you get to the place you're fishing at that your fishing poles are still there. Now, I mean, if he just threw it on top of the truck, didn't, you did that once? Okay, great sermon illustration here. You just throw it on top of the truck, and there's nothing to hold it down. I, I put the, uh, I borrowed uh, uh, one of Derek's kayaks. It's always good to have somebody that you know that has kayaks, okay? And, and so you need to go into business. You have a kayak rental place over at Derek's place. Anyway, so I borrowed his kayak. Well, I put it on the roof of my camper. And I got my, got my straps out there, and, uh, you know, chink, 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 and I just, it's, it's on there good, man. And uh, I even went up there and put a bungee cord around it for one more, because I didn't want it to fly off the roof while I'm driving. All right, so we understand that if we want to use the things we have, we have to have them in such a way that when we get to where we're going, we still have them and that they're still held to us, and they're still usable. Because, you know, if the fishing rod blows off the the roof of the truck as you're going 60 miles an hour down, you know, Route 72 there, 71. What's the one that goes out to LBI? 
72. All right, good. Got to get my roots down right. All right. So, I mean, you're going 60 miles an hour down there. It, you know, it blows off the roof. It's not usable really that well. Have you ever had a ladder blow off a vehicle while you're driving down the road? Okay. Not very usable. Love is the bond which holds all of this together. You say, well, I've got, you know, this ability or this talent. I've had this experience. I know how to do such and such. Well, that's great. But if you lack charity, if you lack godly love, it's going to blow off the roof. And it's going to be unusable. It's going to get damaged. Love it is, is what is necessary to make the Christian life function. You can have all kinds of abilities and talents and skills and experiences, but if you lack love, it all comes apart at the seams. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to. It is the bond of perfectness. And, and so the risen life is a life that loves. You know, people, are, um, people have all kinds of different glues in their lives. Some people's um, glue is, is, is pride and desire. And they want personal recognition or fame or power or money. And that's, that's the glue that holds their lives together. That's what makes them tick. Take your Bibles. Go with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And um, the, um, the story relayed here, of course, is about a man named Simon who is a sorcerer. He lives in Samaria. He is Simon, the Samaritan sorcerer. And, of course, Philip, the evangelist, Philip, has been up there. He's been preaching. Folks are getting saved. Simon, um, and I'll pick up the story here um, in um, Acts chapter 8, verse number... Um, I'm, I'm just I'm going to do... Hop and jump around. I'm sure the guys in the sound booth will love this. Acts chapter 8, verse number 9. Let me start there. And there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he, uh, that himself was, a, uh, was some great one, to whom they gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. To him... They had regard because that a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now, this is, this is what he was like. And he saw Philip and he, and he heard the gospel being preached and he had a great interest in it. Um, he also saw when Peter rose. Now, there was a reason for this. Of course, the giving of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit were a sign that the gospel was being given now to the Samaritans. Of course, when Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, you know, uh, in, in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto, unto the uttermost parts of the earth, this giving of the sign gifts were an evidence that they were actually fulfilling what they're supposed to do and that the Samaritans were getting saved the same way that the Jews were. It was necessary as a sign actually to the Jews that this was real and it was genuine. So this is one of the things that God was doing. And so uh, Simon is seeing this, this, this giving of the Holy Spirit of God, the sign gifts were being given, the speaking in tongues and all these things, and he's thinking to himself, this is cool. I think I'd like to do that. I wonder what I have to do to be able to. And he even offered to pay. I'll pay you money. You give me that ability, and this is going to be fun. Now, I want to say that Simon, a lot of questions. Was Simon a saved man, an unsaved man? I don't think he was saved. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some main ingredients in salvation. That's repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people that say they have faith, but they're not dealing with their sinfulness. There's no, there's no remorse or desire to repent from their sins. And so... It really draws in question. Then you have the other end of the spectrum where people are so bent over their sins and remorseful for sins, but they don't put their faith in Jesus Christ. You can have repentance, but if you don't have faith, you're not saved. And I would say you can have faith, but if you have no repentance, 
you are likely not saved. And so repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ are integral. They are part of salvation. And so this man, Simon, and I'm, uh, he wants to buy, of course, the ability of, of, the, of giving of the Holy Spirit. And I would drop down to verse number 20, Acts 8, 20. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And I just want to point out, uh, you know, that uh, Pete, this is Peter's harshness towards him, um, but necessary to point out that, you know, this guy is really messing up. You talk about the gall of bitterness and, and, uh, and the, what he's talking about. It's like you're still swimming around in the muck and mire of sin. But he also points out that he's, he's in the bond of iniquity. That word bond that's there is the same word that's used back in the text we're in in, in Colossians chapter 3. In other words, your sinfulness that is, is, what hold, is what's holding your life together. In other words, it's the ingredient that puts everything together. Your desire for power, your desire for recognition, your desire to be you know, recognized as some great one, having the great power of God, that's what it says, having this, op having this ability of captivating people's attention and get, having authority over them. That's what he wanted. That's what, that was the bond of his life. And I just have to ask, you know, what is it that's the main ingredient of your life? What holds you together? For him, it was personal, it was recognition, it was power, it was authority. And uh, Peter says, you know, that's got to go. That ingredient has to be removed um, because it's, it's dreadful and it's destructive. I want to read one more verse of Scripture and I'll move on from here. But uh, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. It's a very similar and very parallel passage to where we're at in Colossians, but it says this as it concludes here in verse number three, Ephesians 4 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Same word we have from Colossians. Different ingredient, of course, but the bond of peace. That desire, and, and this, is a, this is a church epistle. It's, the context is people in the church getting along. One of the main themes that runs throughout the entire book of, uh, of Ephesians is the unity of the body of Christ. That is a main theme in the book of Ephesians. Um, Paul talks about tearing down the middle wall of, of partition. In other words, that Jew and Gentile problem that they had. There were a lot of Jews in the city of Ephesus. It was one of the largest cities in, uh, in the Roman Empire. It had the largest population of Jewish people outside of, of Israel. And so it, would, it was a metropolitan area. It would be very similar to saying, you know, go up to New York City, there's a lot of Jews there, and uh, as, uh, there are more Jews in New York City uh, than any other city in the U.S. Uh, and so there, um, that's, what, that's what Ephesus was like. And, and Paul's saying, listen, there's, there's some, we have some problems here, and the problem is, is that there's this division in the church, and one of the things I want you guys to work on is unity. Of, of bringing yourselves together. And so the ingredient, this is what he's throwing out there. One of the ingredients that the church in Ephesus needs is that everybody would, would bring into their life this desire for unity. So when you, when you got together as a church, what are you thinking? We want to be unified. We want to be unified. We want to be unified. I was talking to uh, my good friend, Brother Tom Fryman, 
um, just a, that was about a month ago. Actually, we were talking about baseball to get started with because he's a big Cleveland Indians fan. And the Cleveland Indians, of course, have the best record in the American League. And the Phillies, of course, have the best record in the National League and, of course, have the best record in baseball. And if they'd stop losing like they've done the last two nights, they might keep that, all right? But Brother Fryman and I were talking a little bit about baseball. He's retired uh, from the ministry for about two years now. Um, Jeremiah Sargent, Brother Robert Sargent's son, is now the pastor of that church there in Ohio, Masson, Ohio. And I was asking him, I said, how, you know, I, I asked him very bluntly, I said, um, you know, not every transition goes very smoothly in churches and, and you know, when new pastors come in. I said, I said, uh, what, did, what did you do? He said, I spent a year, uh, 18 months, he said, I spent a, uh, 18 months, a year and a half, um, bringing unity within the, the body there in Massillon, Cornerstone Baptist Church. He said that, that was what our church needed in order to make this transition work. So he, what he did was he brought in a bond of unity. He brought in an ingredient to help this thing work its way through. And it has is, it, it is worked wonderfully. That church has is, is done really well. It's been flourishing. Brother, um, Brother Fryman was there. I think he was there for 45 years, if I'm not mistaken. And um, prior to that, his father-in-law was the pastor of that church. Penny's uh, dad was the pastor of that church. So they, uh, and he was there for probably 40-some years. And so they've had a good, long legacy of faithful men in that, in that uh, pastorate. And, um, and so that was, that was uh, the one, <laughs> when I asked somebody, I, and Brother Fryman's a very serious guy, if you, uh, if you ever get a chance, he tells some really good jokes and they're mostly corny, but when he's serious, he's serious. And uh, he gave me a very serious answer. Um, that is exactly what this verse is talking about to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so his desire was to have unity within that body. And so he brought that in as a key ingredient. Here we see this ingredient of peace, desiring to have peace within that ministry, which builds unity. And so these, these are the type of things when you consider the fact that, you know, we, every one of us has some type of ingredient in our life which we think is going to hold things together. I mean, the things that are important to us. So, you know, if, if, it's, if what's important to you is fame and power and money, then, you know, you're going to have an ingredient of, 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 of desire uh, for earthly things. I mean, when you get up in the morning, that's, what you're, that's what's the main thing on your plate for breakfast is the, a, a gaining of earthly things. And so that's what kind of holds your life together. I mean, the end result is not good, but we all have some type of passion. And, you know, uh, maybe um, this was years ago. I was, I'm, you know, there's a couple artists that I really enjoy um, their artwork. I'm an MC Escher fan, in case you didn't know that. Love his, he's a graphic artist. I love his artwork. And uh, I was reading uh, some quotes from him, some of the things he wrote about uh, about his artwork, and, and he just had a passion. He said the graphic artists, their passion really is to convey their ideas to as many people as they possibly can. And that, of course, that artwork is the expression of doing that, and that's what they're driven by, and that's what he was driven by, trying to express something that, to, to reach as many people as he possibly could. So everybody has a passion. Idealists have passions about things. and it is not, There's nothing wrong with that. But, but as far as us as believers, we have to be, something has to be in our lives which really holds this thing together. Back in Colossians chapter 3, he says, and above all these things, put on charity because it's the bond. It's what holds together the completeness, the maturity of your Christian life. Because if you don't have that love, it is, it's all worthless. You know, you can, you can be a great preacher. If you have no love, uh, then you're just making noise. 
that you can have a desire of ministering to people and you can be a great teacher, but you don't have love. It, it, it becomes you know, orthodoxy, it becomes dry, it becomes unfruitful. Love is the key ingredient. Back in our text there, please, in Colossians chapter 3. So the risen, the risen life, if you be risen in Christ, the risen life is a life filled with love. Put on, therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved. And, you know, this is um, back, you know, back in the text there. Um, uh, verse number 12, of course, verse number 14 is where we're talking about, about putting on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And um, I, I just want to mention uh, just a couple things um, as we're winding down here. Um, the Bible tells us there in verse number, verse number 12, um, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. And then it goes through a list. And, and so I want to I remind you that you are the elect of God. Now, if, if you're familiar with terms like election, uh, often, of course, you know, spirals down into arguments about Calvinism. I am not a Calvinist. If you don't know what Calvinism is, you're very fortunate. Thank you very much and I hope you stay that way. Um, I knew nothing about Calvinism until I got to Bible college and began to read, you know, of course, that you, you know, you have to, got to learn about everything. And, uh, and it just, you know, I scratched my head. It wasn't until, actually, I was in the Midwest that I met some Calvinists, and boy, they left a bad taste in my life. I just, it was just, oh, I just, nothing to do with that, okay, theologically or any other way. But um, you are the elect of God. By, by elect, um, I put it this way. I believe in election, and I believe in election uh, collectively. I believe that the Jewish people were God's elect people, and God chose to minister to the Jewish people. Some of them got saved, some of them did not. But he chose to direct his love and attention and grace towards this nation of Israel. Then God chose to extend his grace and love and mercy towards the Gentiles. That, was, that is an election. Some are going to get saved, some are not. But that is a choosing. And that there's going to become a time where God is going to take that, that, uh, the natural branch and put it back in, and he's going to deal with the nation of Israel again. And so I believe in election in, in that sense. It's collective. And so by saying that, when he says you're the elect of God, in other words, God has directed his grace towards you. He's writing to the folks in, Coloss in Colossae. It is primarily, uh, unlike the city of Ephesus where there are a lot of Jews, the, the church in Colossae is primarily a Gentile church, just as well as the church that was in Philippi, primarily a Gentile church. And so by putting out the fact that they are elect, what he's doing is kind of reinforcing what he says in verse number 11, that there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor non-circumcision. He's talking about you know, the circumcision, that's the rituals of the Jews, and there's others that have no ritualism in their lives. Barbarian, Scythian. That word Scythian is a weird word, and it's, uh, it's kind of like a tribe of people uh, that are as far removed uh, it's kind of like, okay, here's, the, here's the, the Greeks, they're cultured. The barbarians are uncultured people. The Scythians, they're even worse, okay? They're, they're, off the, they're like off-the-grid kind of folks, okay? You think about it that way. So he's reminding them that even though they may not be the Jews who are God's chosen people, you are still elect of God. I mean, what does that mean to you? to be God's elect. God has a divine purpose for you as God's elect. That also means spiritual protection, and it also means tremendous responsibility as well as the privileges that go along with it. Being the elect of God is a big deal to, to understand that God has purpose and plan for your life. And because of that, there is some obligations. He talks about that, again, um, in verse number 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. They're, they're, again, these are characteristics, all right? We are holy. Um, 
That word holy means to be set apart unto God. That's what it means. So when you got saved, you were sanctified. That word sanctified is directly related to the word holy. You were set apart for God. Like, like, the, like a, uh, one of the vessels in the, in the, te- the temple or tabernacle. It was specifically designed to be used for God, for worship towards God, and for God's purposes. That's us. And, and so uh, we are capable of all that God wants to do with us because the fact that we are elect and we are holy and we are, as it says in here, and beloved. That word beloved, that's associated again with the word um, agape. We are, in in other words, we are recipients of God's love. That's a good thing. Now I want to remind you, you know, the Bible tells us to be holy, for I am holy. That's, That's a responsibility. But also, I want to read from 1 John chapter 4. I'll start in verse number 7. I'm going to read down through several verses. It says this, Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is of God. Interesting. We're talking about agape. Interesting. We have a responsibility to express love because God loved us. Are you the beloved? That's what it it said in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12, that you are holy and beloved as one of God's elect. If, you're, if you are loved by God, guess what? You have a responsibility then to love. He said, let us love one another, for God is love, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. So you think about that verse of scripture. We're back in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12, and it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's our characteristics. We're holy and beloved. And he goes through this list. Bows of mercy kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, having Christ, uh, uh, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And you have this beautiful list here of characteristics, and they are driven by the fact that we are God's elect and that we have experienced God's love. And, and so, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. Colossians chapter 3 is a church epistle. It centers around um, the, um, the need within the church to, uh, to exercise these things. Um, and so, the desire, of course, in Colossians chapter 3 is to, is to challenge them to live a risen life with, the, with this great ingredient of agape, God's type of love in our lives, so that it impacts and affects our relationships within this body. And, and certainly, if that love uh, is in our life, it should, it should extend f- well far past this body of believers. It's kind of like, well, i got to love these folks, but I don't need to love anybody else. Well, that, that's just not the case. You know, the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts, Uh, the Bible reminds us. And there's this necessity of expressing the love of God uh, into a world that is so dark and and so void uh, of this type of love. And so, but our love um, that we've experienced from Christ should be such uh, an ingredient, a bond in our life that we are exercising these characteristics Bowels of mercy. Anytime you see that word bowels in the scriptures, often we think about our guts. Um, That's just the the expression they have uh, of saying the inward part of us. So mercy that's generated from within. It is a feeling, it is an emotion, uh, but it's it's rightful. Christ was very merciful to people. He was moved with compassion 
when he when he saw uh, folks that were you know uh, scattered about like sheep without shepherds, and and so it, that was, it's driven by this this inward compassion, kindness. That's an expression. So um, you want to do nice things for people. I mean that's the, that's the best way I can I can say it. Uh, and so kindness is driven by an understanding and an appreciation of the condition of others. If you don't care about other people, you will never be kind. People that are kind are kind because they understand and they care and they observe and they want to do something to be nice to other people. And so if, if you can characterize yourself as being kind, that's because you are very mindful of what others are going through, of what they're dealing with. Humbleness of mind, that has to do with a, um, a good self-image. Uh, meekness, and that is, uh, meekness is best described, the best definition I ever heard is, is power under control. It doesn't mean, meekness does not mean weakness, that means the ability of uh, handling yourself in such a way to allow God to manifest his power and his authority and not you taking the reins yourself. Long-suffering has to do with our dealings with others, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Those two things going hand in hand here, forbearing and forgiving. It has to do with how we deal with other people. And so I want to read one last verse of Scripture and we're done because this is a parallel um, here in Colossians is paralleled from Ephesians chapter 4, and if you would please, and I'll finish with verse number 30 through 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the risen life. The risen life is a life that is bound together with the kind of love that God has given us. It's the main ingredient and it holds all these good things together. I hope that that is an ingredient that's in your life, that your life is bound together by the love of God. Lord bless you. Thank you for being in Sunday school this morning.